Hey there, Tear Talk fans. Russ Hamilton here from Keepers of Chaos. Anyway, uh, going to do a quick video here. This is going to be one of a uh, compilation, I believe, that um, Anthony Ganji is going to do. And uh, I had to pick out a subject to fill, so I thought I'd pick out something a little bit different, a little bit unique. This particular video is going to be about the difference between being a victim, as in being uh, victimized and or attacked um, while you're on the job on duty, and the difference that there is when you might be the victim of a crime just as a regular civilian out there on the street. So anyway, let's go ahead and let's get to it. So basically, the way I'm going to start this thing is I'm going to regale you with uh, three different stories of things that happened personally to me. And so I'm going to start with the very first one. I used to have this uh, gig that I worked in the... Uh, you know, late afternoon uh, or late morning, really um, early afternoon on the West Block Yard. And overhead, I had a, I had actually, you know, a guy with lethal force up there, bottle H and K bottle 94. Um, so that was all good and it was really super active yard, all kinds of things. Having a very dense population on there. I mean, it was always crowded, you know, two, 300 guys at a time, but a very small yard. So anyway, this one particular day I was, uh, you know, out by the back where the fence is. And I was just kind of, you know, standing there, had an inmate maybe about, you know, seven, eight feet in front of me. He was kind of talking to me a little bit of chit chat back and forth. And I noticed another inmate start to come up on my side and I thought he was coming up to ask me a question. And so as I started to turn toward him, um, he just basically sucker punched me and he caught me right, you know, dead square in the eye. Uh, and it ended up, uh, you know, scratching and, and tearing, uh, my cornea a little bit, which is bad because when you start off a fight and you, and you, you know, only have half your vision, it's really bad. But I managed to trap his arm underneath mine as he came around and I managed to, you know, kind of hook him one way and then came back and, uh, ended up clotheslining him, ended up on the ground. Guess what? My overhead was nowhere to be seen. He was off wandering down the inside of the chair on the other side. And so I had, you know, nothing I could do. No one knew I was out there. Managed to get my whistle, start blowing at it. Fortunately, the guy, he was kind of out of it. Um, at that time, uh, no other inmates jumped in. So good on my part. Anyway, uh, kind of fast forward a little bit. Uh, didn't really think anything more of it until about six months later when someone, uh, administrator came up to me and said, oh, by the way, they're not going to prosecute that. I was like, what? And he went back, oh, yeah, that. I thought, well, they were going to prosecute it. I never knew that they might, but they didn't. The Marin County District Attorney just wasn't interested in it, even though it was clearly, you know, self-defense, my use of, in my use of force and stuff. Clearly, he was the aggressor. I'd never seen, never had any other interactions with this inmate before. Yet, they decided that they simply weren't going to do anything about it. And that was the first and last time I ever heard anything about that. So anyway, we're going to get on to the next story. So anyway, story number two, all right, this happened once again to me inside a segregation unit and um, I had an inmate, uh, he was handcuffed, don't remember exactly now, I was taking him back and forth or something, either from an interview or from shower to a shower. Anyway, I ended up uh, putting him back in his cell and uh, for whatever reason, as I was trying to get his handcuffs off, as uh, he was inside and trying to, um, you know, put his hands out and I got one cough off. He spun around and uh, caught my uh, left hand and started uh, dragging me, uh, you know, into the food port. So at that point there, you know, I had to, you know, make a really quick snap decision. I decided I was just going to try and, you know, and punch him. And so I missed, but I, you know, I put my arm in there as far as I could uh, because I knew that that would, you know, at least give me a chance to maybe break the hole. It was kind of a risk. And then uh, I managed to, you know, kind of, you know, do a thing where I kind of like circled back around and re-grabbed his arm, pulled it out, brought it, managed to drag it back out, you know, over the food port. Uh, right then, thankfully, he saved my career, my sergeant, uh, Sergeant Parker. Uh, and he says, like, in slow motion, it's like, no. So I didn't end up breaking his arm. But I said, OK, well, let's at least get the bracelets off and and everything. So anyway, I held his arm there. We got the bracelets. Ended up with uh you know some nerve damage to my hand. It still doesn't work right to this day. Um but uh anyway, uh time goes on, you know, and uh 
you know, just pretty much nothing happened, nothing happened. Then after about a year of this, they said, oh, guess what? You know, that guy over there, he took the plea deal. Okay. So he ended up doing three years for what he did to me. And uh, that was the first and last I ever heard of it again. So anyway, that wraps that one up. So now we're going to move on to the next one. So anyway, story three. Story three goes like this. It's my very last week as a sergeant. I'm in the process of retiring, right? So anyway, uh, we ended up having this big blow up on my yard and we got like um, some guys inside a dorm that are rioting and some that are out and we've deployed some 40 millimeter uh, guns along one side of these guys and we're getting the guys, you know, out of this dorm and putting them on the ground out there. I have one guy, looks like he's trying to hide something up his, up his ass. I pull him up. Anyway, um, as I start to handcuff him, he pushes back on me, tries to spin around. Anyway, I end up kind of like suplexing him over, end up twisting my ankle. You know, down on the ground we go. We're wrestling around. A couple other staff responded. We get him all restrained. But I sprained my ankle, which really sucks because they already had calculated, you know, all my pay and all my sick time that I had accrued and vacation time. So I had to tough it out the last, you know, I think the last five days um, after that or whatever. And anyway, um, once again, same old thing and uh, never heard anything from it ever again, really, except that they said that uh, I think I called someone like six months later and they said, oh, yeah, they weren't going to bother to prosecute. He did get found guilty in an internal disciplinary, lost some time and stuff. And well, that was it. So anyway, I'm going to take you now to the fourth and final story. So, yeah, story number four, um, it goes like this, you know, retired little me doing my civilian thing and um, in the store, I'm down there at Lowe's picking out some stuff, getting ready to, you know, buy some materials, get all my honeydews done. And uh, anyway, I hear a guy say something and it just doesn't sound quite right to me. Anyway, uh, you know, little hair standing on the back of my, I just knew something was wrong. So anyway, I abandoned my cart and I go down to the end of the aisle and this guy is down there trying to rob the place and he's trying to, you know, grab the register and get out. And so uh, anyway, the store manager comes up and starts telling, hey, you have to leave the store now. And so I'm looking at the store manager like, what do you want me to do exactly? Because uh, he kind of knew me a little bit. And so he's just make him go outside. So we kind of flush him outside. And as soon as he gets outside, he starts picking up these big, huge landscaping rocks, you know, and uh, all of a sudden, you know, he's like crashing these things into cars and trying to throw them at people. And so I'm dialing on my phone and I have the local PD and they're on the way, but they still can't tell me ever, you know, how far away are you guys? This is getting really bad. I really thought it was going to hurt someone. And then um, he started to go across the road to this little place where there was like a Starbucks and stuff there really bad. Now I'm really concerned that he's going to get in there and start hurting people, but I can't get close to him because he literally has you know, some massive rocks and uh, he's hitting cars with them and doing all kinds of crazy stuff. So anyway, um, at that time he has the last rock and he just manages to hurl it. I was a little bit too close. I catch it right in the leg above the knee. So then I'm just like, well, you know what? I'm already hurt. He doesn't have a rock. So I did my best, but that kind of slowed me down and I rushed him as fast as I could. But just before I get to him, he manages to pick up a couple of other rocks, thinking those aren't going to feel real good upside my head. But right then, the police chief of the little town I'm in, you know, he comes rolling up and uh, boom, dude hits his uh, car with a rock. Um, the police chief gets out. I circle back behind him. Uh, the guy's kind of now in a little bit of a standoff. Um, he starts to reach up once with one rock. The police chief uh, hits him with the taser, no effect, right? So anyway, um, just ends up that the guy goes back around the street, picks up another rock, and then uh, he's starting to come toward the police chief. The police chief drops the taser, uh, you know, pulls the pulls his handgun out, levels that up. The guy says, don't do it. And man, I could see everything. I could see his uh, finger starting to, you know, tighten on the, trigger and everything. I thought, wow, this is going to go lethal right here, right now. And then do drop the rock. All right. So anyway, um, 
I ended up, you know, ambulance crew came by, checked me out, uh, you know, cool, everything's, it's not fine. I'm limping around. Once again, I've managed to get myself hurt a little bit. Uh, not a big deal though. Uh, but anyway, I go ahead and I head on home. So about the instant I walk in the door and stuff, my phone rings. Well, what's going on? Well, it's that county's uh, victim, uh, you know, victim services. They're calling me already just a few hours ago and they're wanting to know how they can help me. And they're telling me about all my recourses against this guy and about how, you know, if it goes to trial, that they'll help me and they'll be there with me and they'll talk me through it and they'll tell me how afterwards I can go ahead and I can, uh, you know, file a civil complaint against this guy, possibly get some money. Well, you're not going to get money. You're not going to get blood out of a turnip, obviously. But um, anyway, I mean, they're with me through the whole thing. And so, you know, a couple of times I called them up, you know, and asked them, you know, if this guy had made bail or anything and he hadn't. And, uh, you know, they're right there. They're telling me which day all of the court dates are going to happen. And they've sent me this big package of what all of my rights are. And uh, they send me the thing I'm going to need because now he, he's taken a deal um, and, you know, he's supposed to do like six years or whatever. And uh, they've gone ahead and sent me the packet to make sure that, you know, that I'm going to be notified when he paroles or whatever. I, I never bothered to, to fill that out or anything because it just wasn't, you know, that kind of a thing. And I mean, the whole way, I mean, I was being treated like royalty. So anyway, uh, I guess that if we're going to get to what the moral of the story is, um, Shame on you legislators out there. Shame on you administrators. Shame on your district attorneys who just think that correctional staff are cannon fodder for inmates. All right. That's not the case. Um, I take that personally. I've been a victim, unfortunately, uh, numerous times of violent crimes. But what I'm saying is, is, you know, as a professional, when I'm out there, when I'm, you know, being of service to the public, how come you guys can't back me? How come you can't make sure that, hey, everything's okay with me? How come you don't advise me of what my victim rights are? It's time for this to start changing people. And so that's why I chose this particular subject. That's why I wanted to get this off my chest, chest and just show you people, you know, what the differences are. We need to start demanding more of our legislators. We need to start demanding more of our administrators, more of our elected officials. <clears throat> so just food for thought. And I thought I'd leave you with that. Um, because even in this day and age, even when civilians are treated fairly well with respect to that, they've kind of uh, not so much done away with that as they just decided to start releasing felons everywhere and they'll use any excuse. And that just means they're going to make more victims, but still to a degree, if you're a victim as a civilian, you have way more action than you do as a correctional officer in this day and age. Hey, I'm Russ Hamilton. I want everyone out there to stay frosty, stay awake, stay aware. Don't be complacent. Stay safe, people.